um, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for um, and giving me this opportunity uh, to share some of my research with you today. And I'd like to thank our cute little intimate group that we are. Um, I think that we are the best, obviously, here because we brave everything. Okay, so writing under the reign of the infamous uh, Roman Emperor Nero, Seneca the Younger prescribes untainted food as a blow against the destructive influences of others' extravagance. Seneca argues that back in the good old days of early Rome, food was simple, which meant that the men of that earlier Rome had stronger bodies. But the elaborate and pricey food of his day, he asserts, poisons the body and inhibits digestion. Referring directly to his own humble dietary practices and the benefits of fasting, he contends that although some may initially complain about the hardships of abstaining from food or feeling thirst, or that the stomach will at first rebel, eventually food will become hateful. The felicitous result is that desire dies away. In fact, Seneca claims that happiness comes when a person learns to limit eating and drinking. Seneca's attitudes towards hunger and digestion are part of a broader trend in Roman literature from the first century BCE through the second century CE. In our time together today, I will argue that during the late Republic and early Roman Empire, Roman authors used moralizing views of hunger and digestion as ways to mark a person's class or marginality in society. This analysis of hunger and digestion in Roman literature addresses a key moment in Roman history, a period marked by turmoil and a social and political restructuring that challenged traditional behaviors and hierarchies. Romans watched the Republican institutions that play such a critical role in shaping Roman identity take on different forms and meanings. It is particularly striking that elite authors who were not doctors and who were not writing medical texts began to fill their writings with the detailed accounts of dietary practices and thoughts about hunger during this period. Norbert Ilias's masterful work, The Civilizing Process, on French and German manners provides insight into this development in Latin authors' texts. He argues that when people of talent and renown concern themselves with bodily behaviors, it is an indicator of social restructuring. Notably, during the period of social and political restructuring that defined the transition from the Republic to the Principate, Roman authors give almost continual commentary on their own or others' dietary practices. Latin authors praise of simple foods and humble dietary practices, especially their own eating habits, brings out the moral uprightness that is closely associated with upper class men. Their discourse on simple foods and voluntary bouts of hunger suggests that choosing a specific diet played a significant role in the performance of status. Moreover, the physical effects of these dietary practices stand in stark contrast to the bodily defects and illnesses they attributed to persons who enjoyed finely prepared food. Or in other words, they juxtapose their tempered and disciplined flesh, which recalls the body type and habits of good old Roman founders, to that of the bon vivant, who is easily identified by his protruding belly and sickly countenance. Yet this high regard for unadorned food and dining habit belies elite assumptions about food and personal agency, which concomitantly barely masks the, the unease they experienced in the evolving social world of the early Principate. So I will begin by first looking at how elite authors describe their own eating habits and attitudes towards hunger. Then I will look at how elite authors describe indigestion and those who were afflicted by it. And finally, I will turn to how Roman authors describe the hunger of exiles, slaves, and captives, which notably highlights these individuals' marginality and lack of agency. So let's begin with Roman authors' descriptions of their eating behaviors. Now here I just want to offer a side note. So I'm going to be focusing, because of time, on Seneca the Younger. Um, because I think he offers us the uh, tastiest morsels to chew on. Um, but, uh, and I'm going to be looking at uh, his letter 87. Um, but I've given you here some other examples of different authors who kind of suggest similar, um, type, or similar attitudes here. So like many authors, Seneca the Younger underscores the benefits of simple dietary practices. Notably, these benefits have moral undertones and help establish social relations. For example, in one letter, Epistle 87, Seneca writes that for two days he and his friend Maximus have been traveling with only a few slaves, one carriage, and only the clothing they wore on their back. He seems proud to share that they slept on the ground, though on the ground is a relative concept because he mentions he has rugs and a mattress. 
He boasts that his lunch is so meager that nothing could be subtracted from it, and it only took an hour to prepare. In fact, he seems proud to report that he and Maximus are never without figs, which he prefers to eat with bread if he has bread, but if lacking bread, he is content to eat only figs. Seneca declares that this lifestyle is marked by its simple diet and pleasant companionship creates the ideal circumstance for the soul's happiness because it is able to lay aside all extraneous things. And I should note here that Seneca the Younger, is um, his works are infused with Stoic thought, though Seneca has his own brand of Stoicism. But what this means is that he usually is seeing a, a, a clear divide, be divide between the animus and the corpus, and he's always trying to raise the soul above the body. So let's take a closer look at this description. Seneca's humble dietary practices and living conditions in this anecdote highlight the agency that is so intrinsic to his position as an elite Roman male. Remarkably, his definition of simplicity while traveling entails the accompaniment of slaves, a carriage, as well as sleeping on the ground on a mattress and two rugs. And although he may only have the clothing on his back, it was a choice that he and his friend Maximus made upon their journey, rather than what is a daily reality for the enslaved individuals on this trip. What is more, his simple lunch, which he claims only took an hour to make, is cooked by slaves. However, it is unclear from his discussion whether only one slave or a few slaves had to cook this meal, which means preparation might require multiple man hours. Seneca is only aware of the time he must wait before he eats. In effect, Seneca's simple diet serves to underscore his position and power in society. He has the privilege of requesting a less elaborate meal from his slaves, the leisure to indulge his desires to travel in a more modest manner, and the choice to sleep on a mattress placed on the ground. By making these supposedly frugal choices, Seneca is able to assert the prerogatives of elite agency to behave in a restrained man manner which demonstrates his disciplina and his ability to indulge in the mental pursuits aimed to elevate his soul above his body. Moreover, the lack of food, or at least the variety um, of it, that most likely defines his slaves' dietary options and the enforced control and surveillance of their behavior is not the type of simplicity or discipline to which Seneca aspires. In other words, his vacation into self-denial has not been forced upon him by necessity or enslavement. Rather, his choice to relish this manner of living, however temporary it might be, is done as an exercise for his soul's benefit, a situation that asserts his power and status in Roman society. <coughs> Excuse me. Seneca's pronouncements about the benefits of enduring hunger amplify how he depends on his diet to display his agency and disciplined lifestyle. Discussing the poisonous effects of rich food, he observes that in Rome's more disciplined past, men's bodies were still strong through the consumption of plain food that served as nourishment to a hungry man. But food now is a burden for a full belly. Hunger alone allows food to nourish the body and not weigh it down. Using again himself as an example of the rewards of enduring hunger, he mentions coming home one evening after traveling to find that his baker and cook were unprepared for his arrival, which meant that Seneca had to wait a few more moments to eat. This delay had the happy result of Seneca finding some spare moments to sit at his writing table, which he uses to ponder the benefits of a temporarily empty belly. He claims that hunger has taught him not to be squeamish about bad bread, which is a fine lesson to learn because no one knows when misfortune might strike and even a rich man has to change his desires. Musing over hunger's lack of ambition and fussiness about what food brings us in, Seneca moralizes that extravagant dishes are but instruments of luxury and do not bring happiness. For Seneca, hunger represents the body and, and its demands as natural and existing in the world as it should. In fact, hunger becomes an exercise, an option to choose when one desires to bring the body under control and to learn temperance, rather than a frightening reality that promises debilitating effects. Or in other words, Seneca's hunger asserts his privileged position and agency because he elects to limit his diet or prolong the physical discomfort of an empty stomach. Thus, elite authors like Seneca make themselves models worthy of imitation in a society they claim is ever more marked by the corrupt behaviors of their contemporaries. 
and affect dietary choices and occasional fasting, and the physical effects these choices had on the body become ways to distinguish a performance of wealth and status that separated the truly powerful Roman men from those who falsely wore the garb and ate the grub of luxury. <coughs> Seneca sharply underlines the association of, indi- um, I'm sorry, put forward, sorry, I jumped to the wrong, to the wrong part. Put forward as a foil to proper elite uh, practices, indulgent diets and the resultant chubby body become the favorite targets for many Latin authors. Describing dietary practices of their social competitors, Roman authors paint them as unruly and misguided freedmen or overreaching sub-elite men who live beyond their means. In their undisciplined pursuit of luxurious food that signals social prestige, these bad eaters are identified by elaborate, messy, and sometimes tricky meals alongside socially confusing or degrading dining atmospheres. Roman authors frequent implications that that bad eaters have had servile backgrounds only underscores elite authors' attempt to demarcate their disciplined choices in the face of unhindered access to food from their social competitors' inability to embody elite agency. For elite authors, distinctions between easy digestion versus indigestion add to elite authors' categorization of approved or inappropriate social behaviors. Specifically, their comments about indigestion reveal their continued attempts to craft a body image of indulgence and thereby social deviance. In fact, indigestion for these authors is not an indication of physical problems, but rather of moral failings. For example, the poet Catullus, writing roughly during the mid-first century BCE, aligns sound um, digestion with a worry-free existence of a small household, (coughs) country living, and a plain diet. Listing the bodily harm one suffers after a rich meal that mixes a variety of dishes, Horace writing near the end of the first century BCE, uh, describes dinner guests' pallid countenances, clogged bodies from excessive consumption, and interrupted sleep, which they suffer after such meals. Thus, Catullus and Horace indicate that proper and, in fact, good digestion is the happy consequence of making lifestyle choices that are in keeping with traditional Roman values. But poor digestion proceeds from indulgent eating habits. Now, and I apologize for this here. Um, I, I, for time, I kind of tried to, I don't want to read the quotation, but I wanted to give you a sense of uh, how he's describing the body of um, a, gour- a gourmet or gourmand. Um, and I've tried to kind of highlight, I hope it's not too busy here. But um, Seneca sharply underlines here the association of indi- indigestion and indulgence. Comparing reprehensible eating habits of his own day with the dietary practices of Rome's rustic past, he paints a vivid picture of the gourmand's poorly digesting body. Now note that the the gourmand's body is simultaneously pallid, thin, weak, riddled with ulcers, yet somehow maintains a distended stomach that exposes his indulgent living. Seneca is also quick to point out that the body's thinness is not the result of hunger, but of an inability to process food. Its poor state is the result of useless consumption. The expanded belly in conjunction with the bon vivant's weak, drippy, and diseased body puts in sharp relief this greedy stomach's refusal to nourish the body as it should. For Seneca, indigestion is the disease of the rich, and I would say the nouveau riche, who reject living in accordance with Rome's humble origins. Those who do so, he warns, must endure the physical, its physical side effects. Marshall and Juvenal continue, Juvenal continue this mingling of comportment and disorderly digestion, in particular showcasing the physical form of opulent consumption. Marshall marks Latinus, who complains of constant fever. By listing Latinus's lavish lifestyle of litters, baths, mushrooms, oysters, wine, and, soft, and a soft purple bed, he asks, is it any wonder that Latinus' fever refuses to leave when it lives so comfortably? Again, physical ills come from high living. Relying on the visual imagery of a gullet swallowing more than it is able, in this case a boar, Juvenal wonders who can stand to witness such filthy luxury. Yet he warns such vile acts are not without punishment. A man must carry an undigested peacock in his belly with him into the bass, thereby risking sudden death or intestate old age. Thus, according to Marshall and Juvenal, indigestion signals the moral failings 
of others' inability to curb their deviant behaviors. So in short, this type of invective suggests that these authors were working under a prescription that traditional Roman social hierarchies were being threatened. Furthermore, it illuminates how, they, how troubling they thought these challenges were to Roman class structures through their representation of the bodily harm men endure as a result of consuming extravagant meals. They rely on the visual imagery of a gourmand's body that is recognizable by its distended belly carrying undigested food. So just as Roman authors depend on eating to categorize acceptable or inappropriate behaviors among the elite, they also employ sp um, specific perceptions of food consumption and dietary practices to indicate s marginalized people or groups in the Roman world. Pushed to the edges of society, exiles, slaves, and captives illuminate how elite authors attempted to winnow those who belonged from those who did not easily fit into traditional Roman social fabric. Exiles of the Black Sea, Ovid relies on the loss of appetite in his thin, frail body to reveal the excessive suffering he endures in the locale of his banishment. He despondently shares with his wife that the climate is unbearable and he cannot grow accustomed to the land or water. Even the houses are unsuitable and the food is lacking. Notably, his physical and mental suffering are so visibly striking that he proclaims he prefers death to the constant reminder of what he once was. And perhaps in his most explicit leak to the bleak locale of the town to which he has been exiled and his ill health, he notes the physical effects on his body that would make it so his wife would not even recognize him. He declares his features have changed, his body is weak, and his skin is more pallid than fresh wax because, because not, he underscores, of too much sex, food, or booze, but this horrible environment. In other words, Ovid attempts to demonstrate that it is not his own dietary practices that cause him injury. In fact, he underscores his tempered behavior in food and, dr and drinking by pointing out that he mostly drinks water and is careful not to eat too much. In this way, he parrots other Roman authors' proclamations of restrained consumption. But despite its adherence to generally lauded dietary discipline, Ovid's body belies his complete lack of agency. In contrast to the honed and tempered flesh assigned to those who practice modest consumption and, live, and simple living, his body has no strength and his color is paler than new wax. In effect, he suggests that the performance of restrained dietary choices means nothing when other aspects of one's social standing and agency have been undermined. Tellingly, his body betrays the ignominy he suffers. <clears throat> In his novel, The Metamorphoses, often translated the golden ass, Apuleius's main character, Lucius, expends much of his energy while in ass form pursuing his stomach's demands. Now, I just want to give a quick note here for people who are not familiar with the golden ass. Uh, the main character, Lucius, is driven by curiosity about magic. Um, and uh, at the beginning, he really just want, he has this relationship with this uh, slave girl named Photis, whose mistress is a witch. And he convinces her to um, steal a potion that will turn him into a bird so he can fly, but she steals the wrong potion and he turns into a donkey. So it is perhaps my favorite thing to read from the ancient world if you've never read it. So as Keith Bradley has argued, Lucius's transformation into the beast that is most readily associated with, the menial, with menial labor serves as an allegory for slavery. As Lucius plods along through his various adventures and misadventures as an ass, Apuleius often remarks on the negative and unnatural effects of hunger. By doing so, he brings out the differences between elite representations of beneficial hunger and the type of privation that they imagine the enslaved in their society daily experienced. When Lucius is turned into an ass, he commonly describes how hunger affects his belly and spurs his constant pursuit of food. In order to satisfy his hunger and previous appetites, Lucius is forced to sneak food from his various owners, thereby taking on behaviors associated with a slave. In one of his first attempts to appease his nagging stomach, he indiscreetly eats vegetables meant for human consumption. Not surprisingly, this has the unfortunate end ending of Lucius being beaten, and in fact being beaten so much that diarrhea explodes from his rear. In another scene, he, while his captors and owners sleep, Lucius consumes baskets full of bread as he tries to fill his bottomless belly. When he begins to gnaw on these loaves of bread, he notes that his jaws are weak from long hunger. In another section, he pilfers leftovers from a gourmet meal 
which layers his own stereotypical, stereotypically st slavish behaviors with those of two brothers who labor as cooks. And I should note here as well, too, that in um, ancient Roman law and literature, cooks are commonly um, perceived to be slaves. Now, before discovering that Lucius is the culprit and that they can make money off of his human behaviors and appetites, these two men come to blows when they assume that the other is stealing food that they have claimed from the remains of their slave owner's meals. In fact, whenever Lucius disrupted, disrupts another's access to food, it often results in violence. This pattern of violence denotes that food was a carefully guarded commodity for slaves as well as for other non-elite people he encounters on his travels. Additionally, their reactionary and clandestine practices to obtain food reveal an assumption, or perhaps a reality, that enslaved persons had little or no agency as regards their diet. They were dependent upon their slave owners or their own illicit actions, which frequently had high-risk consequences. In my final example, um, Apuleius also employs the fear of hunger to paint a pathetic and frightening punishment that dramatically underscore the lack of agency attached to captives. For example, after Karate and Lucius unsuccessfully attempted to flee their enslavement, their bandit captors devised a grueling punishment for the pair. They threatened to split Lucius's throat and place Karate alive in Lucius's belly with her face poking out. Then they toy with the idea of throwing both over the cliff left to be exposed and lying in the sun in order to become a feast for vultures and dogs. And here I'm quoting um, from The Golden Ass. While she is alive, her dwelling place will be the dead beast's belly. The, oppress the oppressive stench will scorch her nostrils. The deadly hunger of continued fasting will cause her to waste away, and she will not be able to contrive of her death, for her hands will not be free. End quote. In the agony of this imagined horrific death, hunger and the belly become the tools of torture and death for the kidnapped and enslaved girl. Indeed, her captors seem to revel in the chance to rob her entirely of the ability to tend to her nutritional needs as she becomes delectable carry-on for ravaging birds and dogs. The lack of agency and fear of hunger left unsatisfied distinguish exiles, slaves, and captives' eating habits from the elite. So in conclusion, elite authors of the late Republic and early Principate used a person's diet and eating habits to categorize his or her standing in Roman society. By choosing unadorned food, elite authors attempted to uphold their privileged position in society by demonstrating that despite their unhindered access to food items and wealth, they were not enslaved to their appetites. Not only that, it seems that they hoped their tempered flesh that was neither too thin nor too fat and lacked a noticeably large belly, would quickly and vividly distinguish them from those who indulged in luxurious dietary practices. The elite also relied on desperate attitudes to food and sickly thinness to provide clues about who was exiled, exiled, enslaved, or captive in their society. Thus, in the political and social developments of the late Republic and the early Principate, we see Latin authors searching for ways to define and manage their privilege in society. And notably, they rely on dietary habits, digestion, and hunger, some of the most visceral and daily needs, um, daily basic somatic needs to create these identity markers. Thank you. Thank you, Vera, for a great paper. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, yes. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Yeah. In the first part, I was, I, was, I was struck by the difference between then and now. But when, if, if you put obesity in place of indigestion, and, and you think now uh -huh. of the, of the ongoing you know, the phenomenon of obesity, and if you were to say anything uh, like Seneca might have said, Mm -hmm. you know, judging the obese, mm -hmm. uh, you would be shouted down. And any attempt to, say, um, moderate hospital treatment, you know, the suggestion that you should not treat obese people because they have bought, you know, brought the illness on themselves, uh -huh. is also shouted down. And it's really interesting that in those days you could say, you know, you could, you could do the moral dialogue through food and mm -hmm. disperse it widely, and, and people might or might not listen. Whereas today, 
when Seneca might say we've gone completely out of control, this kind of free dialogue is, or at least speech. Well, I think, um, well, at least in the U.S., I can't speak to what's happening uh, in the U.K., but in the U.S., there's a, there's a lot of fat shaming. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, there's articles and, and discussions about this often. And obesity, there's also a discussion about obesity and how obesity might be attached to class as well because of access that they have to food, what, what food is available on welfare services. Um, and uh, usually those are government subsidized and those, those government subsidies are associated with corn and uh, or sort of things that are not that are not necessarily have, yeah, the most healthy for the body. Um, so I think that there's kind of, I, I would say that, I, I think that you often see, again, I'm speaking from perhaps American culture, but these kind of ideals are seen, like in the elite culture, this move towards only organic food. Um, you know, and I, I often will fall into this myself, but you know, you want, you want to eat something that's more pure, but on the other hand, um, that sort of, the price on that, uh, the sort of culture that grows around it, um, uh, eliminates, uh, alienates certain people of certain classes because they can't buy it, they don't have access to it. Um, the focus on thinness uh, in the U.S. Size six. Yeah, size six. Yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah. I, I think that, I, I actually think you, we feel a lot of echoes, uh, especially in modern American culture from this. Um, yeah, but that's, uh, is that answering your question? Yes. yes okay, yes, okay. Yes. Yeah, um, please, yeah. Um, um, yes, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask how you felt it, uh, what I was struck by was uh, this resonated a lot with Karen Bynum's mm. holding anorexia right, right, right. sense of corporeal mm -hmm, living mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the pure and creating a pure or good person, mm -hmm, a good mm -hmm. being. Obviously, it was more extreme. But how do you, um, how, it's very odd. That's the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And here we are in Rome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, how do you kind of justify that same thing, that same kind of act? Or do you think it's just because? I mean, in that case, it's women have no other option, at least that's the case of society. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But these, this is a very different sort of setting. Of, mm -hmm. You know, the elite have options. So where do you, so how do you sort of speak to Biden? Yeah. Um, and here I'm going to probably sound a little bit hypocritical because I say there's echoes, but <laughs> but I think that we have to be careful about trying to draw continuities. Um, uh, this. So I think what I think is great about Bynum's work um, is, again, yeah, she kind of comes at it as a way of, uh, she comes at it from like a very gendered lens. I'm coming at it, I think, from a different kind of lens um, here on this. But what I think is perhaps, and now I'm making a big generalization, but the body and these needs are so visceral, they're so mundane, they're so important that um, uh, that they can become ways that people uh, use to access uh, different things. So I think what I would say here is that um, maybe there's echoes uh, here, but I think that what you're seeing happening with what Bynum is trying to do um, is something specific uh, to, to that period. But I think that we can see these echoes, like like Norbert Elias is saying, that when, when you see when you see the body become really important, a, 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 a focus on this, that we're talking about social restructuring, we're talking about something that's changing and they're responding to that. So that's how I would perhaps re re uh, respond to that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted briefly, very briefly, to disagree with you. I think we're, uh, in, in Europe too, we're, we're always worrying about obesity. We're always judging other people uh, for obesity. We don't want to say so to them, but we're always doing it. it it's, it's on our minds all the time, even more than on Seneca, I think. But, but, but what I really wanted to do is to thank you for the thought indigestion as a moral failing. I'm going to keep that in mind in the months to come. But also to ask you about uh, the elite tax. Um, I, 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 one hears it a lot. Of yeah, course. yeah. Um, I'm a little worried that it is putting a label on something that is not so easy to label. Yes. And who exactly is the elite? Lucius elite? Mm -hmm, right. I think so. He's traveling alone. Yeah. He's staying with people who mm -hmm. have just one slave. Mm -hmm. like, um, right, right. And I think, I think you're right. And here I do need to start to become, I need to sort of offer some gray areas or sort of, I guess not gray areas, but uh, what's that? Shading. The shading in, in my discussion of the elite. So thank you for that. Yes. And I do think, and what I try to use, um, this is coming from my dissertation, which I'm trying to turn to a book now. What I try to use with, with Lucius, um, or with, uh, with Apuleius, Apuleius as the author, I think, might be more towards the elite. Lucius as the character um, is perhaps not. So, uh, but on the other hand, I do think that, I think in a way that uh, not many other ancient sources do that, that Lucius, um, or, or that Apuleius really does give us 
a lens into this world. And I think a lens that isn't as colored, as tainted as, say, other ancient authors. So I think you're right yeah. to, to say that. Um, and, what, uh, and what I try to do in the, this is kind of being taken from bits and pieces, what I try to do in the rest of my, my work is to show how, um, how this really helps us kind of understand the real struggles, the real, the real things that they were trying to, the, the lower classes were trying to face. But thank you, I, should, I need to start uh, well, defining that more. Yeah. yeah, no, I appreciate that, I appreciate that. I, we're, oh. we're actually using up quite a lot oh, sorry. of time, I've, and perhaps I can ask people to ask questions in the, in the break. Yes, please. And please. we'll all say thank you very much to Mira for a great paper.